My name is Luke Fernandez and I'm this year's VIP Distinguished Speaker Series Chair. Now the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series is a program brought to you by the Undergraduate Business Council of the Macomb School of Business. Today we have Dean Thomas Gilligan, Dean of the Macomb School of Business, interviewing Manolo Sanchez, CEO and President of BBVA Compass. We'll begin tonight with a Q&A between Dean Gilligan and Mr. Sanchez, and then we'll open the floor to a Q&A from the audience. As a reminder, Today's event will end promptly at 6.30 p.m., and we would greatly appreciate it if you would refrain from leaving early. Also, if anybody has a laptop, please close it now. Manolo Sanchez has served as BBVA Compass President and CEO since 2008, and was named U.S. Country Manager for BBVA Group in 2010. Under his leadership, BBVA Compass has established itself as an innovative, principal, and customer-centric bank and a model of community involvement from Florida to California. Sanchez, whose responsibilities include BBVA operations in New York and Puerto Rico, as well as Bank of Financial Holdings, has worked for BBVA for nearly 25 years. He joined BBVA Compass as head of community banking in 2008, having led Laredo National Bank for the previous three years, just after it was acquired by BBVA. Between 2002 and 2005, Sanchez serves as Chief Risk Officer for BBVA Bankhammer in Mexico City. Earlier in his BBVA career, Sanchez served in New York from 1999 to 2002, Paris from 1994 to 1999, and Madrid from 1990 to 1994, holding positions in the corporate, investment, and correspondent banking divisions of the bank. Sanchez was named Alabama Citizen of the Year for 2011 by the March of Dimes and was chairman of the American Heart Association's Heart Walk in 2007. He is a board member of the Financial Services Roundtable, a governing director of the Houston Symphony, a member of the Yale Admissions Committee, and a trustee at the Post Oak Montessori School. A graduate of Yale University, Sanchez earned master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics and in advanced European studies from the College of Europe. In addition to English and Spanish, he speaks French, German, and Arabic. He lives in Houston with his wife and three children. Please help me welcome Dean Gilligan and Mr. Sanchez. Thanks, Luke, and uh, welcome everybody to today's VIP speaker event. Uh, Manolo, I want to start by thanking you and BBVA Compass. They're a very strong partner of the Macomb School of Business. Uh, BBVA Compass and its predecessors guarantee and, and Compass have given over a half a million dollars of gifts to the school and, and you're one of our largest executive education partners too. So we, we appreciate the partnership. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. My pleasure. I also want to thank you for letting us uh, use and abuse your staff, uh, the BBVA people uh, here in Austin and in Houston um, are some of the most uh, significant contributors to the educational goals and missions of the school. Bill helps on our advisory committee and council, and he does a very good job for us. We really appreciate that as well. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you, start by asking you some questions about your career. Um, and by that, I mean career broadly defined. What, what was your first, very first job, paid or otherwise, that helped you learn some of those skills and values you needed to be a successful business leader? Well, my first job um, really was in the farming, um, you know, picking, picking fruit, picking peaches, and in the summer in, in southern Spain. So that's how I started my uh, professional experience. So I, that was probably a very um, uh, humbling uh, way to start any kind of professional career because it's with uh, uh, manual labor basically at the end of the day. And so I, I still remember very well what it's like to be in the fields and, and in a way sort of inspire me to find other ways to make, my, to make a living <laughs> than, than being in the, we got peaches in the summer. Was that a family business? Uh, it was a family business, yes. Yeah, oh, we, it was uh, a farming business, and uh, of course, uh, you can tell that I'm not, I'm not in the farming business uh, uh -huh. since then. Yeah, very interesting. How oh, did you uh, attend college or university right after you finished high school or secondary education? I did. Um, basically, it's uh, I came to the U.S. as an exchange student. Um, uh -huh. I went to. Uh, to Rhode Island, uh, well, I was sent to Rhode Island, a, a small town, and I quickly learned that um, you know I was a senior uh, from Europe, and if I was not taking the SATs, I had no friends in, the, in, in my senior class. So 
that's how I started getting involved. I was, my plans were to go back to Europe and, and do my undergrad back mm -hmm. in Spain. But you know, I was accepted to, to Yale and how I got there was basically because I, I really um, wanted to have friends and you know, the, do the SATs and be part of that process as any, uh, most seniors uh, in the U.S. have in high school, you know, the college admissions sure. process. And that's yeah. how I, I ended up with the U.S. education. Well, so it's kind of not necessarily planned, as you can yeah. see. Interesting. What was your first job out of Yale? Uh, actually, my first jo job out of Yale uh, was grad school. I went yeah. immediately to, uh, to for my master's degree yeah. in London. And after that, I did my military service, mm -hmm. which was compulsory at the time, mm -hmm. uh, most countries in Western Europe. And after that, I went to grad school again, uh, the College of Europe for a right. degree in uh, European economics. And, and my first job was after uh, seven years of, of uh, st school. school. Uh, at, with BVA, it's been my oh, only employer. Right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. A lot of summer jobs, but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. mostly uh, my professional life is just being with BVA. What attracted you to the financial services industry? Really, what I, I first came to the uh, uh, to the financial service, I was an economist, uh, mostly an economist and a political scientist mm -hmm. by by education. I was attracted uh, really into the economic research departments of a lot of the banks, you know, a lot of the economic, fundamental economic research is done in the banks. Mm. That's what attracted me into the industry. Right. And eventually went from that uh, aspiration to more of the uh, real business, uh, the real financial business within the bank. Yeah, interesting. Now you had a meteoric rise in your career through BBVA Compass. What do you think set you apart from your peers that allowed you to be promoted so quickly? Well, at BVA, uh, really what, what really helped me was, was my languages. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the BVA was on, a, on an international expansion. Uh, the, the, so, although most of the expansion BVA uh, first undertook in Latin America, its first investments were in Peru and Mexico. So you, you didn't need the languages for that, obviously. Right. Um, but over time, our interest in the US market, that really made a big difference to have someone who was not only uh, uh, you know, fluent in the language, but also bicultural that could understand the market and, and the people and so make that, that job easier for the bank, sort of integrating a U.S. operation within a big multinational conglomerate like that. Hmm. Interesting. Did you uh, have any mentors at BBVA Compass as you came up? Um, really, in my career, I've had a ton of mentors and, you know, there's a lot of masters that you run into in, yeah. in, in any career. Um, I've been very fortunate. I've had the best teachers really yeah. out in my in my my job, and I've enjoyed them greatly. It's, yeah. it's always a great learning experience just watching some of great leaders act and yeah. and interact. Yeah. Did you seek your mentors out, or well, do you have any advice for students here about how to gain access to the masters that you talked about? Well, um, I think in a professional career, um, I think that's something that. A lot, of, a lot of companies have somewhat, somewhat of a structure around mentoring, uh, but if you do not have that access to that, uh, I, would, I would recommend that you really go out of your way to seek out for that kind of mentoring. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's something that, uh, it's, you know, it's something that most companies uh, you know, see as an investment in the long term. So it's really, it's the, the logic of the system is really to help uh, folks you know, grow Mm -hmm. professionally and personally over time. It's, uh, this day and age, most corporations really have this vision that you, you know, human talent is so, uh, uh, I mean, really the best, the most important asset for any company. You want to you invest in, that, in, in the human talent and really develop it over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any public figures uh, that the students might recognize that you admire, either, either commercial leaders or political leaders? or? Well, this may sound a little trite. The, uh, I mean, the, one of the, the folks that I admire most is Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that's very, a very popular thing to say this day and age, but I, it's somewhat of a, um, a more of a visceral. My own, my own experience with Steve Jobs is that, you know, I, I came in contact with a Mac when I was in college in the mid '80s. Uh, I remember thinking, you know, wanting to kiss the computer because after the. Uh, the old IBM systems, you know, with the floppy disks, and that seemed like a nightmare. And ever since, I've been a, a Mac uh, consumer. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. I, I've never had such loyalty and such uh, love for any consumer, <laughs> anything, in my life. And, you know, I've gone through the best and the worst. I mean, there was yeah. a time where Mac was just, like, really not the, the, right, the, the common thing to do or right. the right thing to do. And the, 
He was right. and still had Max and all my life. And so that, to me, it's, it's such a great lesson about how do you get someone, um, how do you connect with someone through, through selling them products? How do you get that connectivity? It's, it just blows my mind that someone like Steve Jobs could do that. Still, still I think it's the, the, the verdicts out and what, what were really the secrets of that, that incredible story. Yeah. Do you try to um, apply any of those lessons to BBVA Compass and what you do? Um, I think we, I think we are this day and age we are we're, we're thinking more of um, along the some of the themes that resonate with the Mac experience or the Apple experience is the uh, the motivation side of things, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an interesting sort of dilemma that we're in today um, because particularly the corporate you know corporations are are really not. That, that well liked, you know, always think of, have you seen the movie Avatar? <laughs> yes. Hopefully, you know, you know, who are the bad guys in that movie? You remember that? Corporations. The corporations. Yeah. I mean, they're pretty bad, those yeah. guys. I mean, they really are, they go out of their way to destroy a planet, civilization, and, and you, you wonder about what are we thinking about corporate America, which is also an American movie, yeah. but it's a, world, it's a worldwide experience. And, and to have a, a corporation like Apple, which is a, a for-profit organization, to have that such a unique identity and such a connectivity with the consumer, it's, mm -hmm. it just tells you about what we believe is, is the, the biggest secret about them is, is that it connects with the why mm -hmm. of, of what they were doing, what they're trying to provide the consumer. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's that uniqueness of the, 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 you know, the think different experience. Um, and, and I think this is a theme of this century that we see that's very relevant both for our employees or for our clients. Mm -hmm. People want to feel that, that they're dealing with, with um, organizations that have a soul Mm -hmm. And they want to believe that the organization has a soul that has a genuine interest in them. Mm -hmm. And over time, I think that's the, the Apple trick. The Apple yeah. trick is we're, we're, we're creating things for you, yeah. for your, for your, f to have a better life, for you to, to really make a difference yeah. A, yeah. every day. That's pretty unique. Yeah, let, let me push you on that since you brought it up. Um, financial services firms mm -hmm. are not considered to have much of a soul. No kidding. Particularly, <laughs> if, you, particularly if you listen to our president mm -hmm. or other political leaders. Or you watch movies like Wall Street, et cetera. What, 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 do you, what can BBVA, Compass, and other financial services firms do to illustrate the social value that they generate for society? Well, that's, an, that's a good question. I think they, um, you know, the social value of banking is, is very simple. I mean, we, we disintermediate the, really the, uh, the liquidity in the system. So we, we take deposits from, from individuals that have excess liquidity, and we actually funnel that to great ideas. So when we make loans, the, uh, we're making business um, entrepreneurs uh, be able to make their, their projects a reality. Mm -hmm. And of course, other ideas that we help is people that want to go to college, uh, people that have an idea to start a family, and they need a household, they need to create a home, an environment, and make a loan. So, there's nothing, if you think about the logic of banking, of course, is, is very, very simple. And we take a lot of risk in doing this because we want to make the loans. You know, I just had my, I have a six year old and we took him to open his checking account. And so we walked them through this. Uh, I had the banker walking through this and we showed him, you know, here's a vault. Your money is going to be here. We're going to be paying you an interest, not a lot of interest yeah. this day and age, uh, because we're going to lend this money out to other people. Yeah. We'll make sure that money comes back to the bank so that you get your deposits back. So in a way, we are the engine of the economy. We're, we're the clearing house for all this uh, cash system we're in. And, and we serve a purpose that is that in that we also have a, a genuine stake interest in the communities that we are, that they thrive. Mm -hmm. So our bankers, if you, if you look at the, the, the number of employees, bank employees are community leaders, mm -hmm. civic organizations, charitable organizations. It's, it's phenomenal. I mean, it is in the tissue of society sure. uh, to have a banking community that is responsive, that is giving out their own time right. to help to make that community a better place. The question is, how do we get to, this, to the pits we're in right now? Yeah. And, and it's because banks, some banks, some bankers were not straight. I mean, they were not, they, they were not following uh, principles that they should have been following, and, and, and so they had a short-term view of things. Um, they, uh, they were doing things that were legal, but they were not probably morally acceptable at the end of the day, and, and, and the, we, create, we created, some, bank, some bankers created a big mess mm -hmm. that we're still trying to get out of. So mm -hmm. no wonder everybody wants to blame the banks for, for a lot of things. Banks started this crisis. 
-hmm. was a financial crisis, the 2008 crisis. Uh, it was a crisis where basically a lot, of, a lot of loans that were made that should have not been made were finally, you know, the wake up call came. Party's over, guys. You know, time to show that all those loans you made are no longer, are not going to be paid. And mm -hmm. guess who had the loans? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the banks. Mm -hmm. Somebody else had the loans. Mm -hmm. Because they had been repackaging the subprime loans, they had been sold. You know, in Norway, there were citizens in Norway that went bankrupt over these. Mm -hmm. and, and so the system, the, you know, the, 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 the society lost its genuine trust in the banking industry. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happening right now is that everything is being thrown in the same bag. So yeah. the public has a very hard time understanding who is a good bank, what's a bad bank, what's a good banker, what's a bad banker. Uh, more importantly, they can't really tell anymore what the functionality of banking is yeah. out there for. So these are testing times. I mean, I can tell you, our company did not cost the taxpayer a cent. Mm -hmm. So we did not go any TARP funds, bailout funds of any kind anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So I can say to my clients, you know, when I have a, a luncheon with clients or I have a function with my clients or when I make a donation to the UT, I can tell you, mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, Thomas, my money mm -hmm. for sure is my money. It's nobody else's money that we're using mm -hmm. to, to do our part in the, out there and making our loans. So it's a very interesting time and we feel very different. That's why we don't want to be thrown into that bag of, sure. you know, the, the yeah. financial crisis. What did BBVA Cuppas do in the 06 to 08 period uh, to, to have you, you know, to, to keep you from having the kind of bad loans that the other banks did? And what are you doing these days to differentiate yourself from the other banks? Well, way back then, I mean, it was, again, we, you know, this is kind of our three pillars in our organization is, is uh, people, innovation, and principles. Mm -hmm. So principles I've spoken about, that's, that are, are you know, we have internal saying, if you, if you don't, if what you're doing cannot be uh, published in the newspaper, don't do it. Mm -hmm. So what we did, for instance, when we, the first bank we bought in the U.S., Lorena, Lorena National Bank, it had a subprime lending operation. Don't take, you know, there's nothing wrong with subprime lending, but the practices that were common in the subprime lending market in 2007, mm -hmm. 2005, uh, were, were not something that we wanted to do, and we, yeah. we actually shut that company down. Mm -hmm. You know, stated income loans, step up raise. I mean, I can tell you the whole gamut of things right. that were being done. You know, we, we actually shut that co operation down so that mm -hmm. we know for a fact that we were following our principles. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing we do is uh, innovation, which talks about the future, uh, the question about the future. You know, banking industry is really not in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. now, I'll give you an example. Um, real time, Bank, banks don't operate real time systems. I don't know if you realize this, but we actually go process all your, your transactions in the day and we actually uh, batch, the, batch them during the night. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if any of you have noticed that you may go to the bank and deposit a, right. a check and it doesn't it's, show up until the next yeah, day, that's right. Yeah. Right? right? Now this is the 21st century and, and you know, Walmart does not operate in batch processing. They, right. they want to know what they're selling every minute of the day. Right. You know, um, Every company, Apple computer, wants to know by the second. So nobody is working, not, banks are not working in real time. Hmm. Uh, we are the first bank coming out with a real time platform that mm -hmm. we're gonna launch at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the first bank to come up with a native iPad application. Mm -hmm. It blows my mind because there are 7,000 banks in the US. Yeah. And so to be the first one in anything, you really have to be, go out <laughs> of your way to get that done. Why do we do that? Well, basically, um, because we saw the Apple gadgets, and we know the Apple gadgets sell like, yeah. you know, hot cookies, and we saw, well, definitely, definitely, you know, most of my companies said, well, let's have an app that, that, you, that you hit, and then it takes you to the browser. They started yeah. thinking, well, this is a browse, another browser experience, and we said, no, we need an application that takes advantage of the surface of this device, and then we were the first ones. We beat all these other big banks to, right. to the job. Innovation um, is, is having a long-term view of things. Yeah. The technology, um, another great thing we're working on, um, you, you familiar with Siri in the 4S, Apple 4S? No. Is that, uh, you, has anybody heard that? Siri is that you talk to your phone. And, I knew uh, this was gonna happen as soon as you told me you were an Apple aficionado. <laughs> You're um, gonna be over my head right away. I'm sorry. <laughs> but just the anecdote is interesting. You, you basically tell your, you text my wife something and it does it. Siri not available. 
Well, because I, I, <laughs> I, I shut it down so not to interfere with <laughs> yes. the sound. But you can ask it, what's the weather like? And so yeah. it's, a, it's a voice oh, activated see, yeah. operating system. Yeah, yeah. So the company, Siri, actually stands for the Stanford Research Institute. Right. And this, these are folks from Silicon Valley that developed this voice activated uh -huh. operating system, right. la natural language, right. they call it. And so we, we already have been working with them on an avatar for about five years now. Yeah. So this is a, a, a computer, it's really a computer brain that, that what it does is it, it's kind of a, a humanized experience. Right. And it has the intelligence. So if you ask it to, do, to make a transfer from one account to another account, and it's, right. it may actually prompt you to uh, get a loan or to get a certificate of a deposit or something right. like that. Right. So the reason I tell you that is this, it, it takes a long time to see this coming. Uh, now we were terrified about how we're gonna launch this avatar right. in the market and, and you know, people are, are they gonna adopt this? Are they right. gonna be talking to a computer? Right. We know that you, know, you don't wanna talk to a computer every time right. you call a 1-800 number and you ask for, right. But, you know, Apple has changed the rules of the game with this Siri. Sure. Now we can actually, when we launch this, which we will do in a couple of months, we'll be the first U.S. bank to, with a real voice operating system to right. deal with the client. Right. So innovation uh, is really the thing that really differentiates us now and going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, the people. Uh, people is, you know, we're in a, we're in a, in a, in a business that's um, people intensive. It's the heart of what we do. Yeah. Both our employees and our clients are humans. Mm -hmm. And so we are, you know, our, our vision, our internal state, uh, log, uh, motto is we, we work for a better future for people. Mm -hmm. There's no banking in that. There's no money. There's no financial services. Mm -hmm. Because really what we see ourselves doing over time is to really help people pro make progress in their lives, mm -hmm. you know, through the lending, through the sure. savings. Uh, and we don't know what's coming next, really. You know, we see ourselves as a company that could go beyond financial services mm -hmm. one day. So, and this is very interesting because um, in this day and age, uh, there's a lot to be innovated with in, mm -hmm. in companies. You know, we, are, uh, we already have tried a number of different uh, kind of blogging yeah. systems and ways of pro uh, creating new, new way of communicating internally, you know. Right. Uh, we are uh, we're able to uh, to tap the uh, the the bottom part of our organization. Most organizations are so directed from the top down. Mm -hmm. This is this is a century of Wikipedia. You know, mm -hmm. when you think of this collaboration, the the motivation is is completely uh, mutating. You know, we're going from a punishment or reward system to a system that where people are more intrinsically motivated. Mm -hmm. And, and so you have to really change all your incentive systems, all your communication patterns within a, uh, an organization like ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's so people intensive, so that you can capture really all that, you know, all that power that you have in, in, in your people. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three pillars of what we have done and what we're trying to do going forward that will make us really, really special. Mm -hmm. And you can ask any of our employees and they, they will repeat to you a different version, more or less of what I'm saying, <laughs> um, because we, you know, we work in that culture. We want all of, all of our folks really to to be aligned and really follow this this yeah. this vision. Yeah. Can you address the following question? Uh, BBVA Compass is a global bank, banking and financial firm. Mm -hmm. But whenever I hear you talk about banking, you talk about how it really has to generate value in the local community and for local. Uh, uh, both employees and customers. Is there a tension there? How do, how does the global scope keep from interfering with the community values that you have to deliver? Well, we, we, are firm, we firmly believe that banking is, is local. So mm -hmm. in fact, our, our, we call it local because it's local. It's <laughs> what we try to bring is, you know, look at the, the economies of scale and technology, what I'm, yeah. what, what I'm telling you about. Yeah. The, all these developments on the, you know, we can, we can develop an, iP an iPod, mm -hmm. an iPad application, an iPhone application, basically on the same sort of template and roll it out in 32 countries at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there are economies of scale and the, the yeah. global side of it, what it brings to us is a lot of muscle, a lot of best practices. Mm -hmm. And contrary to popular belief, a lot of flow ideas is not from the developed world into the developing yeah. world. Right. We're starting to see a lot of ideas coming in from our, you know, our main operations are in Mexico and Turkey. Right. You know, we are actually seeing Mexico and Turkey way ahead on so many different things right. in the banking industry right. that we are actually bringing to the U.S. Right. So the global, for us, is a way of, of 
acquiring economies of scale and also creating opportunity for best practices import and exporting them. Mm -hmm. but, but, but banking is local at the end of the day. And, but you have to create value. So this mm -hmm. is, a, do you remember ABN AMRO? Yes. ABN AMRO yeah. is a, a Dutch bank right. that basically extract, collected, it was a big multinational banking conglomerate, uh, it started collecting properties in different countries in the world, right. in Brazil, in, um, in the US, they had a yeah. bank in Chicago, La Salle Bank. Yeah. And, and in, in 09, in 08, a bunch of banks from different countries made an offer and broke it down. Right. And so, and proved that the pieces were worth less than the whole. Yeah. Or the other way around. The pieces separated were worth more than the whole yeah. put together. Right. That is the dilemma, that is the catch in global banking. Because mm -hmm. if you do not create value, if all you're doing is collecting, a bank is so global, that if you're, all I'm doing is I'm collecting, here I have a bank in Paraguay, I have a bank in Argentina. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Argentinian banking is very local, and Paraguayan banking is very local. How I, make, how I, make, how I, how I create value is by exchanging, mm -hmm. by bringing those other practices that makes that local operation a better operation with better revenue yeah. streams and better services. Yeah. It makes some sense. Um, it's about five minutes before we're going to let students ask some questions. We, we, ha we asked some traditionally hard questions here, so I'm going to throw those out. Okay. Um, the first one is, uh, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made? All right, the biggest mistake I've ever made. Uh, the biggest mistake I've, I, I've, which I, I think I keep making it one from time to time, is <laughs> <laughs> probably not letting go of something or someone more often than not I see. Uh, at the right time. I think. Uh, I'll give you an example um, of, the, of the banking, although this can happen in the personal uh, realm as well. Um, you hold on to something like, now we've gone through all these mergers, we've merged six banks in the US. And you know, I, I guess I'm young and, and maybe I'm, I'm a little stubborn, so I want every banker that we acquire through acquisitions to, you know, to, to love right. the BVA ideas, to love this rather more complex corporate world they're joining, they may be in a right. smaller bank, and I just, I sometimes I need to know that this in, some of those individuals are not going to adapt, right. that they're not going to enjoy this. That it's a torture. I mean, you know, sometimes I've seen people just be so miserable because I've wanted to hold on to them, and then the day they are, they've decided to move on, it's the best day in their life. Sometimes <laughs> I, I've done it, you know, other ways, but you know, that's that's probably the biggest mistake. I see. What, what's the best piece of advice you were ever given? Best piece of advice. I think I've been given that, there's one piece of advice I, that's been very useful. I don't know if it's the best, but it's been very useful my, in my career, is that to keep my, my options open. Mm -hmm. And I was given that advice twice. When I was, when I was a student by my mentor at, uh, at Yale University, my, my, my tutor, uh, Professor Linz, and, and also when I started my banking career. Because, you know, at that age, you know, I thought I had all the, I knew it all, mm -hmm. and I knew what I needed to do in life, and, I knew, what, I knew what was the right path, and I was convinced to explore other things. And, and really that opened the doors for a ton of things that I would have I not see. experienced. If, w if I would have stuck to my own paradigm of the day, you know, yep. th this yep. is the way to go, this is the way to follow. Interesting. Uh, and this is the last question I have. So students, if you have a question, if you could line up at one of the uh, speakers, that would be, excuse me, microphones, that would be great. Um, and I ask this primarily for the benefit of our students. What makes a person stand out to you when you evaluate their performance? Who do you promote and why? Uh, yeah, that's a hard question to, to, to oversimplify, but if I had to choose one thing, the, the ability to be uh, uh, versatile, the, adapt the, you know, the ability to be uh, a person that has a lot of registers, that is, uh, that's probably the, the biggest uh, the feature that really makes someone more valuable over time. Mm -hmm. These are individuals that are not necessarily in a box. They, are, they have the ability to have so many huh. registers and then they'll give different people what, the, what, they, what they need at the end of the day. Not just sometimes the skills, right. but also their styles. They can be a coach when right. they need to be a coach. They can be coercive when they need I to see. be coercive. They want to be, and they have to be visionary. They, so they have all the ability to, to have all those registers. So you like a generalist as opposed to a specialist. I yeah, think. a generalist that, that has the that has the, uh, the competence of being a generalist. Uh, the competence, uh, a competent generalist, I would say. Competent generalist. <laughs> there we go. A specialized generalist. <laughs> Great.
Eva. Hi, so thanks for coming. My question is, um, so you seem to be very involved in the arts in Houston, and you speak many languages, and I, the problem, not the problem, well, kind of the problem. In, bus in the business school, I think a lot of students are very, almost too focused and very tunnel visioned with their majors, with business, and I'm wondering what your take is on the importance of the arts and other liberal arts and other studies, um, and specifically, which ones do you think could be complementary to somebody working in finance? Yes, I think, and that touches on the, the last question that you asked about, you know, what makes it someone different, and versatility and that adaptability is important. I think this day and age, um, you know, we have an ability to, uh, to have a broader experience of things. You know, the knowledge is not no longer captured in the university's library where you have to get to those books to really tap that knowledge. The knowledge is so widely available and you have an ability to explore so many different things that, and I think that when you are developing the technical uh, knowledge base in your field, whether, you know, you, whatever major you're doing, you know, there's that technical part of it that is the technical that we know that of uh, this time, this day and age, and, and, and it's so widely complemented by a bunch of other things that, um, so I think that I, I can only encourage all of you that have a dilemma all the time trying to balancing, you know, the core sort of body of your instruction with all these peripheral activities, the peripheral uh, centers of activities that you could have, I think that it adds a lot more complement, it's more complementary than it looks. That's kind of my own thinking about uh, things like that. Of course, the arts, which you mentioned, is one case in point that, um, uh, we see it all the time. Um, but in, is there anything specific, such as languages or uh, philosophy, or is there anything that you think stands out especially and is especially complementary? Um, well, I, I don't. I think it goes by what you what you're doing. I mean, I think that. Uh, but generally, um, I, I think. I mean, if you ask me, uh, language is definitely something that I would recommend uh, that that everybody takes upon itself, upon himself or herself to develop over time. Um, I think languages is a lesson uh, in, in thinking differently. You know, I, I remember when I started learning Arabic and I realized that Arabic had a, a, f a that there's a pronoun for two, two people, like two of you. Uh, of course, in Texas we have all of y'all, <laughs> uh, but uh, we don't have a different conjugation for that. But there's a female you, and there's a, fem there's a male you, and there's a female two of you, and there's a male two of you. So just imagine the richness of that way of thinking of, uh, you know, there's so many ways in, in the language that really, you think language is just a pain in the neck, just trying to learn what other people think, but it really is, is blowing up your brain and is bringing new patterns in thinking to your, to your problem solving ability, which you need to have as an adult, as a professional adult at some point, uh, just to touch on one. But I can only give you my own personal preference, the languages and, the, and the music is definitely the two that, that, I, that I enjoy the most. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael, uh, I'm a senior here. Um, I wanna ask you, are there any particular books that you have gotten insights from either that influenced in your personal life or your professional life, business or non-related? Books. Uh, I can give you the, the latest books I've been reading, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, I've been reading, um, on, on, the, on the question of motivation, I would recommend Drive, which uh, is a book by uh, the author called Daniel Pink. It's, it's probably the best summary on, 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 on this uh, theory of intrinsic motivation. And it, the author, it's, it's really a collection of really all, all the research on, on the question. It's not just for business, for schooling as well, and motivation generally for students. And um, there's another field that I recommend, I don't know, generally for social scientists, is the behavioral uh, economics field. And there's a few books out there that you may want to read. Uh, this Dan Ariely. Uh, on um, uh, predictably rational, that's one book, mm -hmm. and then of course there's, there's an, the Nobel Prize on behavioral economics, David Kahneman. Kahneman, Kahneman yeah. 
He just came up with a book, <coughs> Fast and Slow Thinking. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm not through that one. I'm just barely starting on that. But um, <laughs> I, I think that within social science, those are the two books that really are changing the way I'm thinking about a lot of things. And I say that because I haven't run into books in a while that really are so iconoclastic um, mm -hmm. in the way we think about business and also personal relationships. All right, thank you. You're welcome. With a company as global as yours and the size of yours, the end goal sort of seems to become to try and be everywhere all at once, but you can't do that too fast. So how do you gauge when it is time to expand, whether it's to a new country or even within a country like the US, branch out to the rest of it from, say, the Sun Belt, where you guys are particularly strong, to the rest of the country? Well, generally, we follow, uh, you know, of course, one of, the, one of the stakeholders that we focus a great deal is on our shareholders, which I, we haven't talked about yet, but, you know, <laughs> shareholders is someone you want to definitely take care of. Um, and so we want to provide our shareholders, a, 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 you know, a, a good return. And we be, our belief is that uh, we want to be in growth markets. So what, really the, the main theme we follow is where are the growth markets. That's why we are the fourth bank in Austin. Some of you may not know this, but we're the fourth bank in Austin, the fourth bank in Texas. And when we came to the US in uh, 05, we wanted to be in Texas and a few other states within the Sun Belt because we believe that these are the states with the best demographics the best potential for growth over time. And that's really the main thing we follow. So Turkey, for instance, which is our latest investment, or Mexico, which is another one of our biggest investments, is we see a lot of growth potential in those markets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez, for coming out here and answering our, okay. <laughs> our questions. Uh, my question to you, um, it's very important to me, is what is your favorite instrument and why? My favorite instrument? The piano. The piano? Yes. Instrument, I mean, well, we say? Sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the second yeah, part was why, um, why, 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 why. Yeah. Well, I don't know why. That, that may be, um, that's obviously a personal preference. I, I would have to uh, uh, reflect on that. Maybe I, I'll owe you an answer on that one. <laughs> Do you play yourself? I play the piano, yes. But I don't know how I got the, into the piano and not to violin or something else. Yeah. Thank it's you. Just, uh, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Kara Biasucci and I work at McCombs. And I have a couple of questions on ethics. I've heard other um, BBVA uh, executives speak and I was very impressed with the, st the stance that the company seems to have based you know, on creating an ethical corporate culture and also communicating that to your, to your customers. So I was curious to know what, you, what factors you think influence um, corporate culture and how you create an ethical corporate culture. Well, it's an interesting question. I think our, our corporate culture is uh, obviously comes from the Latin tradition. So we, we, we come from, you know, the bank was founded in Spain, but by now, you know, Spain is really the, uh, the small, not the smallest, but certainly there's a lot of components within the bank that are much greater uh, than we are. So corporate culture is, you know, what I can tell you about our company is that, and I've been in it, I've been in it for 25 years, so I know it's like a big family. And so the main ingredient that keeps us together is that culture. And that culture comes from, you know, we, we've created a set of principles that we, um, we have really sort of massaged over time, really have agreed and distilled, and we share those principles. And we spend a great deal of time thinking about how those principles apply to everyday life, and every employee has, goes through a workshop, and they reflect on that. Uh, at this point, our culture is, is a multi, multinational type culture, but greatly influenced by the Latin traditions, I would say. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wondered is, have you as CEO ever made a decision that you consider to be ethically correct, but that actually cost the, the company money? In other words, I'm, I'm interested to know if there were things that you did because you thought they were the right thing to do, not necessarily the most profitable thing to do. Selling the subprime business in Laredo was probably. Yes, that, that was one that, that, that may be a case in point. Um, 
that's probably the best, the best example. Um, but we do that more often than not. This day and age, we do that all the time. Believe me, there's, um, I think that in the banking industry, folks are really uh, you know, concerned about the, the image of the industry as taking advantage of, of the consumer. And, and you know, we are extremely sensitive to that. And that informs a lot more decision making in this day and age than ever. Good evening, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, thank you for coming out to talk to us. Um, having spent a lot of your time in Spain, I was just wondering with BBVA's involvement in the La Liga, which is your favorite club soccer team, and <laughs> Barca or Madrid? <laughs> I'd be glad to tell you that. Barcelona. <laughs> thank you. They are the best. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Brian Wiggins. I'm a fourth year finance major. I'm really excited to be here tonight because I will be starting a career with BBVA Compass in July. So I'm really happy about that. <laughs> and my question is about the European uh, sovereign debt crisis. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on the implications that contagion, the threat of contagion has on BBVA and in turn BBVA Compass. Yeah. The contagion to BVA Compass is, is non, because BVA Compass is an FDIC insured institution with a very strong capital base, 12% to one capital ratio and 9% leverage ratio. So it's, it's a very strong institution. And, and with the way we run subsidiaries uh, and the way the regulation operates, basically you have no dealings really with any organization above you because the, the rules of the FDIC is you have to protect the the depositor. So that's kind of the theory, but the practice of this whole thing is that BVA is a very diversified company. So Spain represents about 30% of its bottom line in this day and age. And so what happens in Spain affects the profitability of our Spain operation, but what's happening, if you, you know, been following the stock and our, our financials, is that we're making up for the difference elsewhere in the world. Because we're in fast growing markets like Mexico, like most of Latin America, like the U.S., and so that's China. That's making that's making the difference for what is a one market. Those are the benefits of diversification, which you study in your finance career. Um, it applies not only to portfolios but also business portfolios, like the ones we run. And that is that is that is the trick. That's the secret of BVA not being affected. But the the crisis in Europe, as you know, if you know anything about Europe, which most of us know enough by now because we read it every single morning, um, you know, this is a crisis that will be resolved in European speed. And that is, you know, when you think the European Union started being put together in 1957 with the Treaty of Rome, uh, we are here 50 some years later still, we have a monetary union for some countries, now we're building a, a fiscal union, that's the next step, and that's the solution to this crisis, to really have a fiscal union uh, it takes 27 countries to agree on a new treaty, abandon their fiscal sovereignty. That will take 27 parliaments to vote on this. So European speed is, a, is really a term that you need to think about. This is going to take a long time to resolve. And in the meantime, uh, you know, with, with Greece still not being resolved, the, the main two problems in the short term is, you know, the Greek problem is, is a very specific, very isolated situation that the Europeans are taking too long to resolve. And then you have to build a firewall to protect the rest of the countries that don't have the problems that Greece has. And even those, the firewall is still kind of not necessarily built to the level it needs to be built. So that's kind of a long answer to a rather a complex uh, problem that, that you know, we could be talking for four hours about. For sure. But his job will be there in July. I think that's what he oh, was yes, asking. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. He'll be there. Yeah. He'll have a job. <laughs> not to worry about that one. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Gerard Hunter. I'm an um, undergrad student, freshman, and the question I wanted to ask you was, what was your inspiration growing up and um, going through the ranks um, um, for, for your company? What was the last word you said, the inspiration as I was growing up? And yeah, I said um, um, your inspiration from growing up all the way to being the um, president and CEO of Compass Bank. Well, to be honest, I never thought I was going to be president and CEO of a bank when I was growing up. Um, I think I was, I was more focused on learning and, um, 
and really taking advantage of the opportunities that came before me. And, and I think that's what I've been following sort of uh, over time, you know, coming to the U.S., uh, going to the school here. You know, you heard my, my you know, I, I worked in France, I worked in Mexico City, I worked in Texas, you know. Every time I worked at one of those places, there was somebody that called me that day and said, uh, guess what, we have a job for you in, um, in France or we have a job for you in Mexico City uh, or in Laredo, Texas. And so um, you have to have the vision or the appetite to really grab that opportunity, jump on it, and, and take what it comes with it. Sometimes great things may come with it. Sometimes the, un the unknown may come with it. So I think that's kind of, that's really the path I've followed. And, and it's, it's where it's taken me. I, I don't think I had any designs that I was going to go to this position. Mm -hmm. It just sort of evolved over time. OK, thank you. Thank you. It's funny to see everybody stare at me. It's kind of pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, thank you for coming, please. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, I, like to, I like to ask this to a lot of business students, and I'm glad that you came because I wanted to, your personal definition of how do you define success. You know, in the business school, you know, we all want to become successful. And just as students, we came to UT because we wanted to be successful. But what is your personal definition of success? Okay, well, but that, you mean about, about my definition for, for, for in the personal domain? As personal, from a business standpoint, a business not standpoint. a definition of, like, we find in a dictionary, but <laughs> how would you see yourself as being successful? You know, I, I, I'm not sure I've, I, I've thought about this enough to have an articulate, very articulate answer to you, but I'm going to give you a gut type answer. Um, and I like that one better than a, <laughs> a pre-written Business answer. school answer. Well, I think success is about making a difference. You know, and I think in business we call it creating value. But in real life, it's about making a difference. So when you actually create something that is, that is staying around and that is special, that's when you're successful. You know, I can give you an example. Are we successful in, 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 our, in Texas, for instance? We are. I mean, we, we created the fourth bank in Texas. Our first acquisition was the Laredo National Bank with 45 branches, uh, 2,000 employees, 3 billion in assets. We have um, almost 400 branches in Texas, uh, 12,000 employees. I mean, you just feel, you feel like you are, and we're everywhere uh, to make a difference. We probably, you don't know if you heard, but recently we, we are, we're going to uh, enter into a contract to have our, our name on the new soccer stadium in Houston, the Dynamos. Stadium is going to be called the BVA Compass Stadium. That's so that's when we say, gee, you know, we're, we're business is prosperous enough that we can actually go out, get into a, a long term contract with the owners of the stadium and say, here's our name. People like soccer. Uh, some people like soccer. Uh, <laughs> and they, we're, we're, we're letting them enjoy that uh, uh, in, in this coming season. So that's, that's my definition of success. All right, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you said that Siri would be used to make transactions and loans, possibly down the road. I was just wondering if that would now or down the road uh, replace human jobs. I don't think human jobs will be replaced anytime soon by machines. Uh, but 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 machines are replacing. I mean, on, let me let me take that back. On the uh, on the core of of what we do in banking, which is um, advice financial advice, it's, I don't think machines are going to replace that anytime within you know, anybody's lifetime. And the reason I say that, I don't know if you've tried this, you probably have tried, if you have any savings, to buy some stock. And more often than not, you're going to get it wrong, and you're going to burn yourself. And when you, if you amass a certain, um, a larger, savings account, you probably want to talk to somebody that knows what they're doing. And that's, wh that's where bankers are. These are the people that you're going you're gonna to go to mm -hmm. to get the right mortgage loan. When you buy a home, you want to know to someone that knows what they're doing. Of course, you can read 20,000 pages in the internet, but sooner or later, you're going to say, well, gee, maybe I'll talk to somebody and pay for the service. That, I don't think, is going to go away ever. That's, what, that's the core of what we do. Yet, of course, we didn't have computers. 
uh, 30 years ago. And when computers came, you know, we automated a lot of processes. That also creates you know, a lower cost base for ourselves, and we can provide a lower cost services to the clients over time. So we adapt technology to be more efficient. Uh, we want to also uh, let clients customize their experience. That's another thing about this century, that you know, our clients want to be able to deal you know, not with cookie cutters. They want to be able to have a customized experience, and the technology allows us to do that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan, and I'm a first year student here. And my question is, how does BBVA, and you personally, how do you guys um, prepare for times of uncertainty, uncertainty, and what advice would you give to students who are preparing for the future four years, five years down the road? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, generally in this past uh, year. I took this job, uh, President and CEO of BBVA Compass, the week the Lehman Brothers uh, <laughs> went, went bust. So I can tell you, you never know what's the next uh, mine you're gonna, you're gonna step on in, <laughs> in, in an environment like this. Um, I think you have to, I think you really have to have a long-term view and think about the future in some, with somewhat of, somewhat of a structure. Like if you ask me, what is the, the thing that, that worries you the most on the horizon? It's probably Google. Really, I mean, it is, it is the, they're the ones that can really slice and sort of implode the whole transactional banking model and, and creates, it creates a lot of uncertainty because you know, they're testing the Google wallet. You know, very hard to know what's next. So how do we deal with that? We basically do our homework. Just, uh, we opened, a, an, uh, for instance, an office in Silicon Valley last this year. We have uh, folks deployed in, in San Francisco. They're scouting late the newer technologies. And, and we're talking to Google. Um, we were the first bank to adopt Google apps our employees worldwide, except in the U.S., we're still finishing the legal touches on this, but our bank already works on, on the Google, uh, a whole bank works on a, on a Google cloud. So all of our, our mails are Gmails, really, and they, they, uh, all of our information is on the Google cloud. But they're also a potential disruptor of what we do. Thank you. Thanks. Hi there. I have a gift for you, and that is uh, one of my favorite sayings is learn a new language and get a new soul. And I thought you might enjoy that, particularly given your focus on the company having a soul. Um, my question for you, though, is about whether you've observed different leadership styles with women versus men as they rise up through the company. I think generally the, uh, the diversity within our organization has created better organizations over time. And, and, and women have brought a great deal of richness to, to our organizations. That, that I can tell you. And, and there's, in fact, a lot of evidence of that, uh, way you problem solving on a diverse basis versus problem solving on a monolithic uh, sort of set of decision makers. The, 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 effective, the effectiveness of the decision is, is much richer when you have a more diverse uh, set of decision makers. So we definitely believe that that creates a lot more value for our organization. Do you see any particular leadership styles or strategies that they use to create that additional value? This is um, we, have a, we actually have a few working groups on the, on the question of gender diversity running right now in the organization. And, and, um, and I don't think we've come across so much the styles as we've come, certain features of women's work, like uh, effectiveness, and a few other things like that that come across very, very salient um, attributes of, of women executives that have a, 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 have a few uh, skills that are more developed than the average employee, I mean, within statistical significance. So, uh, styles, I, so I would sort of improvise an answer on that. I don't, I don't, I don't have. Jazz rep. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We have time for one more question. Is there another question? Hello, I'm Hortensia Campbell. I'm a freshman here. And I was wondering uh, about how you maintain your work-life balance and how you manage your stress. OK. All right, work, let me take the second part of the question, the managed stress. Um, 
Fortunately, in my career, I learned early that stress is very useful. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but <laughs> stress is how the human um, body really manages situations in which you want to get best performance. So when you're taking an exam, you know, your body is very stressed and you have high adrenaline and all this. So it's like, in a way, it's like, it's all very physical. Your, your body is really wise, is, is, is programmed to really uh, stress itself when you want to deliver high performance. The trick on stress is that you have to climb the mountain and then you also have to come off the mountain. And that's how you manage stress effectively so that you can, you, you need to allow yourself to be stressed, but then you have to find a, the time to relax and to de-stress. That's, and so you have to build that into your discipline. So you, whatever you do, you just, you know, the, you, you, uh, yoga, I, I do yoga, I, I meditate, those are the two things. I have very young kids, so I also need to de-stress from that point of view. So. <laughs> um, and the work-life balance, well, uh, it's, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, I, I think my, 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 my trick is that whatever I, I have those moments for myself, for my life, my real life, I want to have quality time. Uh, so when I'm with my kids, which is probably less often than I would like it to be, I have quality time with them and I am 100% present with them. I'm not, um, you know, with a Blackberry, with an iPhone, of course. Um, and I'm not, I'm not flying all over the place. I really want to be with them, that, that very moment with them. So that's, that's my trick on, on life work balance. But technology helps us a lot uh, have a better work life balance this day and age. Thank you. Got thank it. You. Got it. Well, Manola, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions. If all, not yet, <laughs> sit tight for one second. I want to turn the program over to Luke and Michael for a brief presentation. Thank you very much, Dean Gilligan and Mr. Sanchez. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I know that we will all be able to take your lessons and apply them to our own lives. As a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present Mr. Sanchez with his personalized Stetson cowboy hat in recognition of his participation in the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. <laughs> 